Shalom. Welcome to another episode of Inspiration from Zion. I'm Jonathan Feldstein, and I have the privilege of being your host, coming to you from the Judean mountains here in Israel. I like to refer to it as the original Bible Belt. Inspiration from Zion is the is a program of the Genesis 123 Foundation, whose mission is to build bridges between Jews and Christians and Christians with Israel in ways that are new, unique, and meaningful. I pray that you will find this, all of those. Through this program, we're excited to connect you to people and stories in and relating to Israel to give you a window to look through, experiencing aspects of life here that you might not otherwise know about. We want this to be interactive, so please be in touch with us at inspirationfromzion at gmail.com and send along any questions and any comments about any topic, anytime. Or you can follow us and like us on it at genesis123.co and on all our social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Stay tuned until the end of the program, we we're also going to share some exciting opportunities, and please feel free to share this with others who will also find it of interest. So today, I always like to say we should go from the West Bank to West Virginia, and I'm having a delightful conversation with somebody who I just met, but I've been re reading up, I, I suppose that videoing up is a phrase, or if it's not, I just made it up, um, with U.S. presidential candidate Dr. Roland Roberts II. Um, let me let me read his bio because it's it's scripted appropriately, and I don't want to miss anything that we might overlook in the course of our conversation because our conversation is going to be really targeted here on Israel in the Middle East. Dr. Roland Roberts II is an American businessman, government advisor, and candidate for president of the United States. He's married to Rebecca Lee Roberts, with whom they have one son, and Dr. Roberts also, uh, who is Dr. Ro uh, Roland Roberts, not doctor yet, but Roland Roberts III, who was born July 4th this past year. He also has two do older daughters from a previous marriage. Dr. Roberts grew up in the holler of Beaver, West Virginia, and started his career at the bottom, working his way through college and eventually getting his master's of business administration from Liberty University and a doctor of business administration from California Intercontinental University. He has led small and large companies and helped underserved people start businesses around the world. He believes that entrepreneurship is the single greatest economic engine on earth that levels all playing fields and does not discriminate. Actually, maybe a piece of the conversation will talk about that and a peace plan I have for, for this part of the world. He has extensive experience with good governance, infrastructure, foreign affairs, education, and diplomacy. He served with former con Congress people and ambassadors on a U.S. delegation to South Sudan in 2021 and in 2022, where he assisted with the stabilization of the transition to permanent government. Roberts is one of the con contributing authors for Ukraine's new constitution as well. Previously, he served as an advisor to national governments on matters of diplomacy, national security, entrepreneurship, education, clean water, wastewater, and waste to energy infrastructure. And, and I have to say, parenthetically, this is not just an interesting conversation for me, but those are all really serious issues uh, for me personally. His mission has been to solve complex, systematic, and structural problems for access to clean water, business and literacy education, and food security in Africa to accelerate the transformation of Africa's economic, technological, education, welfare, social welfare, and healthcare sectors. It was through these efforts that the burden and calling for leading America 2.0 to prepare the ground for an America capable of leading the 22nd century was birthed. The more time he spent in Africa, the more glaring were the cracks and threats to America's global leadership position that the current rut of vile political discourse does not address or secure for America's continued global leadership into the 22nd century. He's created entrepreneurship programs, women's empowerment, and vocational training, and has individual mentorship programs while celebrating people, not dividing them. He discusses issues, not labels, facts, not fantasy, and leads with sound wisdom and truth. He addressed China's intellectual property theft and the trade war to, uh, to Beijing officials directly in the Great Hall of the People in 2017. He was given the African diplomatic designation of His Excellency as Peace Ambassador to Nations from the International College of Peace Studies 
And now with the help of God, he also serves every American or is looking forward to serve every American as president of the United States. Dr. Roberts, really, what a privilege to have you. Um, I, I'm provoked. I'm challenged and I'm grateful for you making time because I think I mean, maybe there are other presidential candidates who most people have not heard of. But to the extent that you are one of them, um, your voice needs to be out there. And I'm really blessed that you've chosen to share that today with me and inspiration from Zion. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be with you. I appreciate that. Yeah. So let's 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 assume that I'm not wrong, that most people know who Donald Trump is. Most people know who Nikki Haley is. Most people know who uh, Joe Biden, right? I almost forgot Joe Biden is um, and haven't heard of Dr. Roland Roberts. Tell us just a little bit about your your personal background. You're in West, you're native of West Virginia, I believe, correct? I am. Yes, sir. And, you know, I grew up in a pastor's home uh, and my father still pastors the same church. They have a Christian school and uh, 40, nearly 40 years there and uh, in the same place. And my mom teaches English. Uh, I went off to a Bible college when I was 18 years old and quickly found out that I had a knack for business. And uh, and so I went, I started investing in real estate and went down the business track. I uh, did get my bachelor's degree from the Bible College uh, in biblical studies, and uh, but really focused on business. For the next decade plus, 15 years, I was just focused on uh, becoming the CEO of a billion-dollar company. I was I did lead several large companies and then started several uh, startups and then I sold off one or a couple of those. Uh, so that was my track. And then, of course, being the CEO of the Hoverboard Company, which was the best-selling product in the world of 2015. Uh, and it was really in 2016 that... Uh, well, and, and just for some some spiritual context, uh, I gave my life to Christ in 2015. Uh, that was when uh, I really uh, surrendered to uh, follow him and, and listen to his voice in my life. And so I can tell you that uh, that was a defining moment and nothing has been the same since. Uh, and he did pivot me uh, into government, more government. Uh, Interesting. So that's that was the the line of uh, of transition in my life. And for of course, of no, yes, sir. Thank you. For a lot of non Christians, they won't understand um, the distinction between growing up in a pastor's home. Me being Jewish, it's something that's ethnic. You're born into as part of a people and a faith going back to Abraham. But someone won't understand why the son of a pastor who's been pastoring the same church for forty years. And you in 2015, which is not even a decade ago, only became a a, a Christian by choice, so to speak, right. um, relatively late in life. How did that happen? Well, you know, I I in the Christian faith, I tr- I know for a fact I trusted Christ as my Savior when I was five years old. Okay. So I I I, I in terms of heaven and hell, uh, it, according to our faith and the way we believe, uh. That's when I trusted Christ, but I did not live for him. I did not. Uh, it wasn't personal. It wasn't a relationship yet. And I think that's okay. the real difference okay. in my life. It wasn't a relationship. I went my own way and I lived uh, more, very you know, worldly and just caring nothing about uh, really the things of the Lord, uh, things of God. So that's what changed. Uh, and when he got my attention, it was all about him. And prior to 2015, it was all about me. Was there something that triggered that in 2015? You know, uh, well, I got divorced, uh, but that wasn't the catalyst. That was a year prior. Uh, It was actually during that time. It it was still ongoing, but that's not the catalyst. The catalyst was he was just doing a work on me. I was searching. He had already started working on my heart a a couple of years prior, trying to uh, I wanted to be a better man. I wanted to be a better person. Uh, I, I it was in me. It's like I could not figure out how how to do it, how to be it, how to accomplish it. Uh, and so I was having all of these mixed emotions, you know, while I was focused on business and running companies and starting companies, but something was missing and mm-hmm. I kept searching and I could not figure it out. And it was one day, it was actually September 15th, it was uh, mid morning. And um, I had just gotten off of a phone call uh, and where a, a, ma- a legal matter was being settled and I agreed to it. And it was at that moment that it had nothing to do with anything that I had just talked about on the phone, or it was just at that moment I said, I am no longer going to fight against God in my life. 
Uh, and, and I know that I started seeing all the different ways that I was uh, really fighting against him. And I felt a little bit like Paul when they say uh, that he was kicking against the pricks. You know, sometimes we're prodded to to do right and we're prodded to go a different direction and we resist and we want to go our own way. And uh, that that never is the right path. Wow. I was just speaking to somebody today who asked me how it is that I established the Genesis 1, 2, 3 foundation to be a bridge bridge between Jews and Christians. And it was actually, uh, I'll go a little bit deeper. For me, it was me being a little bit dense and not paying attention to things that God was putting in my path, stumbling blocks that I needed to pivot. And eventually it, it involved a swift kick in the backside for, for me to come to a, a different place professionally that refocused my life. Uh, but as I was mentioning to you before we uh, before we started recording the conversation, um, this all goes back to uh, a, a, a tremendous experience for me. The first time I was ever in a church in late the late 1980s in Cleveland, Tennessee, and that's a different conversation. That's my story. Not so we're not going to. But I can. The point is, I can relate to what you're saying, not paying attention and focusing on yourself. Um, so I, I'm. I'm thrilled for you and that and that uh, faith journey and also um, a, a, as a mature adult. Um, so what about your candidacy? How how did that come about that that all of a sudden it was it's just uh, 13 months ago that you declared your candidacy? That certainly had to be the product of some significant contemplation, prayer, uh, consultation with your family and, and loved ones. How did that come to play? Yes. You know, it's interesting because I never thought I would run for political office after I ran a decade uh, over a decade ago for state senate. I thought I'd never wanted to run for politics again, not interested. Uh, so whenever I started doing government work, I only desired maybe an ambassadorship or how can I represent the best of America, not the partisanship, not the fighting of America, but how can I represent the ideals, the hope that America can offer the world? And so that was where my head was at. And so whenever I started things in 2016 and 2017 in Beijing, in Shanghai, uh, in Africa. Yeah, and, Africa. Yeah. And, and then Africa for, for, for years, you know, after that, and even South America. Uh, and then most recently, even, uh, you know, Ukraine uh, and so forth. But my, my mission or the way I was thinking about it, uh, was representing the best of America. And so uh, what the real catalyst for me running for president, uh, two things. I used to think, and I still believe, you either have to be crazy or corrupt uh, because that's the only way you get there. <laughs> so we're going to elect a crazy man because you're not corrupt. What you have to do to get there and to appease the American public, it's one of those two, except I'm running different uh, okay. and outside of the normal political system and that is because I believe that there's now a third seat, which is you can be called uh, uh, and be called by God. And so because uh, you don't do this voluntarily, it is not a, a boost. It is not something that is great for you individually or for your family. If, if you take it seriously, if you're not crazy or corrupt and if you're doing it because you're called, there is no inherent benefit the way we would normally see it. Uh, it's and, But when it's not about you, then it takes on a different weight. Uh, and that is what it has been. Because how what he used, the circumstances he used to lead me to this place and those in my life and also my advisors. Uh, I was on the uh, a U.S. delegation to South Sudan. And in, we I was there with the delegation last in August of 2022. And with the delegation, I went back at the request of the president for a private meeting in November of 2022. Uh, and the Lord used both of those uh, situations. The first one, I found myself in a situation at 9 p.m. on a Sunday night before we the delegation was flying out on Monday that I knew we had no business being in. Uh, the situation was, it, I was seeing corruption uh, and we were playing into the hands and we were creating it and we were not doing right by other countries. And, and I saw it firsthand and I was so um, it, it was so bob uh, troublesome that uh, I knew I could not be a part of it. Uh, so I, how do I not be in this situation again? Uh, I'm not going to get up and walk out, or else it's a stain on the United States. 
Uh, but at the same time, I cannot violate my conscience and do this. This is not right. Uh, and so uh, when I went back in November at the request of the president uh, to meet, there were a series of things that happened uh, that could have resulted in uh, and should have resulted in my life being taken. Oh. In fact, uh, the person that they did find that the president would trust, um, his life was taken uh, this past July uh, wow. while I was running for president. And uh, But God spared me, um, and I do believe I had his protection and his anointing uh, for that. And he, when I came back, though, it did give me a lot of soul searching. Where do you go from here? The bottom line is, whenever I can't even represent the United States anymore, it's not even about a political party. It was, oh. and then it became about the whole. And then I could no longer in good faith represent the United States because of some wickedness that we were doing against other people and other nations. Uh, that's whenever the only option was to stand in the gap uh, for such a time as this. And I still would not have done that if it was just my imaginations or, hey, let's do something about this. I did not have that spirit at all about it. Uh, I was just seeking what I was supposed to do in life and what direction, because I was no longer in good faith going to be able to go that direction. Wow. And that is when he called me to run for president. Wow. We, we, you and I, I look forward to a personal conversation at some point in the White House. But uh, there is many, many similarities in terms of in terms of uh, that, that the path of how, how we got to where we are. So you mentioned your family. Um, it's not easy. It's, it's, it's a, your job running a corporation is a full time job, but this is even more so. You're in the public light, and you and 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 being a candidate who most people have not heard of, you have to be double down on being aggressive, as we're doing now to have all these opportunities. So you, you're out there. How, how's your family about this campaign? And 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 I what am so takes? blessed. They are so supportive. Uh, but you know, I have an amazing wife. I I was telling her even this morning during our we call it our family altar, but our time with God together yeah. as a family. And I was telling her, I said, I'm just so few people could ever run for president because the spouse that they have. Like it, yeah. this true, the same is true in business. A lot of them couldn't start businesses because the entrepreneur life is very difficult as well. Uh, that takes a unique marriage and spouse, a supportive spouse. Presidency is a whole nother level. And let me tell you, not only could most spouses not handle it, uh, but because there's a cost of friendship, there's a cost of time. But my wife actually was pregnant when this campaign started. Ah, oh, right, right. Your and son was just born six, seven months ago. Yeah, yeah. So can you imagine uh, a, a pregnant wife? Most women, you know, they at least get their husbands at five, six, seven o'clock at night whenever they get off work. Uh, <laughs> imagine the travel. Imagine that I'm pregnant and I'm on this farm by myself, or I'm, you know, I'm I'm here by myself and I'm having to handle these matters. Um, and and, and and without my husband being right here. And then at the same time, because she couldn't travel once she got to a certain point uh, in the pregnancy. And then once you have a new baby, uh, I, especially our first, you know, you don't want, uh, you know, dad to be MIA. And I didn't want to be MIA. Uh, and so we have had to all work very, very hard to minimize that. But me still do and us still do what God's called us to do. Uh, and, and somehow it has worked beautifully. Uh, our relationship hasn't suffered. I can tell you when I even make certain trips, I try to do more day trips because I don't want to miss a single night with my son waking up and seeing my face or certainly going to bed and, and being able to pray over my family uh, for safety and blessing every yeah. night. Uh, you know, those are the moments that we don't want to miss. And I'm not going to sacrifice uh, a candidacy for that. And I don't think I have to. I think the message and the calling and just being obedient to what I'm supposed to do will carry itself in time. And in the White House, you build the proper team around it, which is okay. It's the it it would be the biggest business that anyone ever managed, but it, the the discipline, the concept, is perhaps the same. And you've got that experience. What 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 will Rebecca bring as first lady? Uh, what she will bring is someone praying for her her husband and uh, raising our children. Uh, but really, uh, you know, she she is such a beautiful soul. She's a gentle soul. She's not an activist. She 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 loves children and she wants to help promote family and children. But she's not an activist. She's not a business person. 
what she wants to do, even in the White House, is to stand behind, uh, stand with me in prayer, praying for me as I'm making different decisions and as I'm working with all kinds of different people. And, it, and once again, it takes an amazing woman to share me with the world. This was a a, a, a wife and a mother who inherently they don't want to share. You know, they, they fight for your time usually. And in this case, she has willingly chosen uh, to share me with the world. And uh, but I also go to great lengths to include them. Uh, and so, you know, that is the kind of first lady she will be. Uh, they they travel with me uh, now as much as possible. Uh, we, we we go the extra mile uh, to make sure they are a part of everything that we do. Great. Um, Dr. Roberts, I want to take a quick break and then I want to come back and move to my neck of the woods. So I'll talk about uh, Israel in the Middle East. But let's Excellent. take a, just a quick break. As remarkable and miraculous as Israel is, and its very existence a testimony to God's faithfulness, in many ways, Israel is like most other countries. Just as there are parents anywhere who have stronger and weaker parenting abilities, and adults become a product of situations in their lives that they cannot control, making their ability to raise and care for their own children even harder, that's true in Israel as well. The Genesis 123 Foundation is committed and takes the mandate seriously to care for the least of these, our brothers, our children. We're committed to bless and strengthen orphans and at-risk youth to invest in them, to empower them, so that their future will be brighter than their past or their present. But Israel is unique in that there are always threats of war and terror which know no bounds. For children who come from homes that are not safe, sometimes the very scary reality of living in a community that's not safe is too much to bear. We are committed to turning orphans and at-risk youth into children of promise. We fund a variety of programs to help those most in need as widely as we can. We invite and encourage you to join us today so that we can ensure their brighter tomorrow. Please visit genesis123.co to find out more and to send your love and most generous donation today. Okay, uh, we're with Dr. Roland Roberts, presidential candidate. Fascinating. I'm enjoying getting to know you. Really am. You're the kind of person you want to sit and get to know. Uh, and I appreciate that. Um, there are many areas in terms of campaign issues, platforms that any presidential candidate has to have. And actually, you have to have something on everything. You have to be a bit knowledgeable and bring the right people in on everything. But today, inspiration from Zion, we're focusing on Israel and the Middle East. And I want to focus on that with you. Um, it's not necessarily uh, to be taken for granted, but it also isn't out of the box either. You, if you grew up in the home of a pastor, Israel had some kind of presence in your life, even as a child. Can you talk about that for a little bit? Absolutely. You know, I will tell you, I think for most presidents, their talk and positions about Israel come from an intellectual place or a political place. Uh, what is expedient or what is not. I can tell you mine goes and comes from a much deeper place, uh, and it is a spiritual place. It is an inherent knowledge and belief that uh, Israel is the only nation established by God. Right. Uh, its borders are the only ones that God drew. Like everything else in the world can be fought over, can be expanded, can be you know shrunk. But the borders of the nation of Israel were given by God uh, to, to Father Abraham and, and, and to his descendants. And, and so there is just no uh, th there's there's no way around that the, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel is God's chosen people. And and that's hard for people in this day and age to understand because they want everything to be fair. And of course, nothing, hardly anything is. But uh, they they spout. Well, that's not fair. Favor. That, that is what they don't want to see. But the nation of Israel, God has favored the nation of Israel. And as a, as a Christian believer, uh, I, uh, we honor that. And we actually pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We are instructed, anybody who believes yes. in God, to pray for Jerusalem and the, and the nation of Israel. So, uh, but that people often assume that, well, that means you justify everything Israel does. No, I don't justify everything America does. 
Uh, there is no perfect nation and there are no perfect people and there are no perfect presidents and prime ministers. Um, but it does mean that we support the nation. It does mean that they are God's chosen people. So it comes from a very different place whenever there's conflict, whenever there's war, whenever there's oppression of, of the Jewish people. Uh, the starting point is vastly different than yes. any other politician. So how do you, okay. So, so with the exception of Nikki Haley and, and Joe Biden, who's a Catholic, and I, well, I, I guess it's not fair to speak about what Donald Trump's faith is or what people, your, your faith is unique. Let's just forget the other people. And you approach Israel from a spiritual, from a biblical perspective as your foundation. As president of the United States of 350 million people, not everyone who is Christian, not everyone who has has necessarily any faith, people don't believe. How do you communicate as the president of the United States to all Americans who don't get talk about Father Abraham or or God's chosen people? Why is it why is Israel significant to Americans who don't necessarily share your faith? Jonathan, I think that's one of the greatest conversations that need to take place in America today. Because as you've seen, the loudest voices in America have not been in support of Israel uh, in this war. Uh, There have been demonstrations on a near weekly basis in cities around America and in our nation's capital for Gaza and against Israel. And the Americans of the post-World War II generation could have never fathomed that. Right. There was a, they took for granted that America was always going to be the best friend to Israel that Israel could have. And we're, we've seen that in this situation, how quickly American sentiment has changed. Uh, and so how I speak about it uh, is to help people understand, number one, that God has favored that nation. And it does not mean we blanket condone everything, just like we don't blanket condone everything that the United States does. But it does recognize the place in history and in, and I mean, not just human history, but uh, all of history, divine history, uh, that they are God's chosen people and that our role is to support and to pray. Uh, and, and to stand with them. Uh, so, and here's what I believe. That, there's a reason we talk about Judeo-Christian values, because we share similar values. Indeed. Uh, we don't say uh, our, our, our uh, you know, Islam, Judeo values, or our uh, any other mix of any other, it is Judeo-Christian values. Our foundation is Jehovah God. So with the 400 plus million Americans that many don't believe in God, uh, they say 72 percent does, uh, which is down from 90 oh. plus percent. Pew. Oh. But that is uh, the, the way that looks. It's not a practical belief in God. Correct. Uh, and so we have to approach it as they believe Israel is just another nation. And a lot of the reports that I'm hearing, people are saying, why in the world do we care what happens to Israel? They're literally using those words and they're saying what has Israel done for us? Why Will, are we going to give them a dime? There's a lot of debate even in Congress today over this very matter. And I can tell you that it is uh, it is very significant. So my response to help the American people is to say, and it's our campaign theme, America needs God. And an America without God will fail. But let me tell you what an America supporting Israel does. It is why our nation has been blessed for as long as it has. America will not be blessed by God if we stand against Israel. Uh, it just, you cannot go against God's people and think that God is somehow going to bless that. And, and, and I look to history for that. I don't look, I'm not just looking to, you know, uh, my machinations or what I, my uh, religion. I'm looking to actual historical events of what happened to nations who came against the Israelites. And there were times, yes, God is the one who gets to judge Israel, not other nations. That's what we have to understand. And he He always has. He's They've been in times of slavery. They've been out of slavery. And then, of course, uh, in 1948, we were able to recover their homeland. Uh, and so that is God's role to judge. 
it is our role to support. Thank you. So it's interesting as you're saying that you, you you're, you're setting up my questions that are coming to me anyway, um, talking about the the history, the American history. Um, the, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we just published as Genesis 123 Foundation published a book, Israel, the Miracle, a uh, compilation of 75 essays by Christian leaders from all over the world. And there are many They're They're all very good. Some of them are outstanding. And one of the most outstanding uh, is, is by an American historian, David Barton. You may know or know. Yes. Of, OK, so he writes about that uh, that relationship between early America, obviously before there was a state of Israel, but with 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 advocating for the um, the the restoration of Jewish sovereignty here in the land and for Jews and Judaism as that other part of the Judeo Christian ethic, and and he writes as a Christian, but he's writing as a as a very substantial historian. I'm glad you I'm glad you um, brought that up in America right now. We're seeing, I don't believe that it's necessarily a rise in anti-Semitism as much as it is a deeper expression of it. I, I tend to think that anti-Semitism has always been, will always be. I've experienced it in America, in other parts of the world, and here in Israel. The the, the nature of our conflict is with people who are at their core anti-Semitic. But you're seeing a lot of American Jews fearful. You're seeing a lot of Jews discriminated against, against, threatened, threatened by some of the most elite institutions that have had a wishy-washy attitude. What do you what what would you do on day one as president of the United States to fix it? So and, and why should American Jews say, ah, and he's the guy who's going to do it? Yeah, well, I can tell you uh, what every American Jew knows uh, it should know. Uh, and we have a, ca- a Jews for Roberts caucus uh, of those who know me personally and have for over a decade and see me in all kinds of situations in business and in government. And uh, and they thoroughly support. And their quote is that Roberts will be the best friend to Israel that Israel's ever had. Uh, that was their exact quote. Uh, but, th- you know, in terms of day one, the one thing they never have to waffle on or worry about, like they do in this administration and in most any others, is will I do what is politically expedient? Will I be silent when when it is politically expedient to be silent? Uh, and then will I be supportive when it's only when it's politically expedient to be supportive? And what they have is they have a certainty of where I stand, no matter what, uh, that, I, that I stand with Israel. Uh, here, here's the interesting thing. The, the war, what, what is happening in Israel today is a precursor to what is going to happen in the United States. Uh, the the battle at the border with uh, with Gaza in the the atrocities of October seventh is about is going to happen here in the United States. Uh, our border, we both are struggling with border uh, yes. issues, and uh, many of people in America, the problem they had with Israel was. They believe the Israeli government, best intelligence, one of the best intelligence in the world, certainly combined with ours and others, knew, and the most secure border in the world, knew this was going to happen, let it happen, uh, so that they could use it as an excuse to go annihilate and eviscerate an entire uh, people group. That is what they hold, uh, uh, some, many in, in America pos, uh, posit. My perspective is that that is exactly a setup of what is happening in the United States. Oh, we wow. have opened our border. We know that there are Sunni Muslim and his, uh, Hezbollah camps and training facilities, massive operations in Mexico. And then we are the ones leading them across the border. It's not that even that we have an open border or a porous border. The U.S. government has, through some a couple of specific NGOs, sent people, and we are providing them aid. And as they traverse and creating the path for them to come in and then providing once they're here. So when you have that many terrorists in the United States that we know of, our FBI director has testified about that within the last week, uh, over 50 uh, uh, have been uh, uh, detained in uh, Colorado alone in the past wow. week. Uh, and so when you have this, 
the the something far worse than 9-11 is going to happen in the United States. It's far worse. And what's being set up in Israel is a test. They're using it as a test of how to handle when it happens here. It's going to happen simultaneously. It will be one of the greatest terrorist acts in the world. And when it does, when America starts to respond, who it responds against, which we're setting it up so we can respond against the people that we're wanting to respond, which is part of the American corruption that I'm trying to stop. And okay. end. But when we retaliate and respond, uh, many around the world will be able to use against the United States well, why are they retaliating and trying to eviscerate and flatten the Middle East when uh, they did let the exact same thing happen to Israel? We, they, they, because if you know it's going to happen and you let it happen, then the world's system of justice right now does not allow you to respond to the proportion that you ordinarily would. Well said. So, so then let's. Israel's in the midst of a war. We're well into four months into a war. The war is specifically against Hamas. It's I appreciate it does it, it's not to be taken for granted that people acknowledge that this is uh, an appropriate war as wars go and and it's a necessary war, albeit wars are horrible. Um, but it is not what people are saying. This certainly I, I I have heard it, but it's still shocking to hear the notion that Israel somehow set this up in order to uh, create a genocide, which also, if we are doing that, we're doing a lousy job because um, the numbers don't don't prove that. But ultimately, the immediate war is against Hamas. We have an objective to bring back 136 hostages, as many as 50 or so may already be dead. And we have the threat on the northern border where I was a week ago uh, from Hezbollah, another Iranian proxy, um, with with actually per last week's podcast episode, um, the expert that I brought on was estimating as high as 350,000 precision missiles pointed at us, which is quite terrifying, to be honest. We have the Houthis in in Yemen uh, blocking international shipping, and and if you follow how he's uh, laid that out, it's also very very strategic. But ultimately, these are tentacles. These are proxies of Iran. What what does a Roberts administration do on day one to cut off the head of the snake, to, to prevent Iran from continuing to have its evil impact in America and the world? Yes, that's right. And, and, and that is where the war lies. It is with Iran. In fact, three weeks prior to the attacks on October 7th, I was being interviewed uh, and they were asking about Israel or excuse me, uh, U.S. and Iran being Iran, uh, Iran being the United States biggest enemy. And uh, I said, uh, yes, but really the issue is between Iran and Israel. What brings us into what makes Iran such an enemy of the United States is the, the their their hate of the nation and, and desire to extinguish the nation of Israel. That's what really draws us into that. Uh, it is our war. And, and, and I appreciate you mentioning the difference between just war and unjust war. The problem is, and, and that's where this humanitarian concept uh, that they keep throwing, they lobbying against Israel and saying right. it's, it's inhumane. Um, th- there's a difference between just war and unjust war. And most of the wars in our lifetime have been unjust. It's over land grabs, over its power, its greed, its money. Uh, control. And that's not what this is. Uh, it is it is a, it is right and it is just. And God gives in war uh, different parameters. In fact, to, to Israel uh, specifically, uh, he has given instructions in past centuries that certain enemies they were to completely destroy and take none of the spoils. Uh, and so uh, he has given different instruction to the nation of Israel, when they've gone to certain wars uh, that he authorized. Uh, so there's just war and unjust war. Uh, but I will say the Roberts presidency, and as it relates to Iran, uh, what I have found is that it is the Iranian regime that is evil and wicked. Uh, m- there are many Iranians that are against 
their regime. Correct. Correct. And there are many American Iranians that are against their regime. They love their homeland. They love their culture, but they understand the evil uh, that exists at the top. And so I want to be clear that I, I love and I want to in a robber's presidency will what I've said is do right by all people in all nations on earth. Now, to do right by uh, people is I try to view it the way God would view what is just. That doesn't mean you don't conquer. It doesn't mean you don't defend. It doesn't mean that I, I will be more aggressive, as a matter of fact, than most any pre, uh, U.S. president you've ever seen when it comes to war, because I don't play the political games. See, everyone yes. else is playing the games, and so they never actually solve the problem. Uh, so it will be very aggressive. Uh, and they might say it's inhumane. Uh, well, why don't you just respond to the exact problem? If they do a little bit, why don't you just respond with a little bit? Because we're not going to play games with evil. We don't dance with wickedness. Uh, it must be dealt with and it must be addressed severely. So during my administration, if Iran, through by proxy or as an act of their nation, uh, did things against the nation of Israel or against the United States, because I do believe we are we are tied at the hip. Uh, we, if we want the blessing of God, and as in my presidency, we will be tied at the hip with Israel. Uh, and I will be regardless for the rest of my days, whether my country is or not. Uh, but because I want to love what God loves and I want to hate what God hates. Yes. Uh, but I will deal aggressively with Iran and they will know on day one, if you so much as lift a finger, if we feel threatened in even the slightest, we will proactively take aggressive action that will hurt, not just a little thump, but you will feel the pain for many years to come. I won't even tolerate the slightest threat against Israel or the United States by well, any means. That's an important message because as you're speaking, I'm thinking of the historic parallel when President Reagan uh, was inaugurated and what the next day, the 444 hostages that Iran, the, 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 the hostages that Iran had been holding, the regime had been holding for 444 days were set free because they knew that there was a new sheriff in town. And, yes. and, and it wasn't the same Patsy Carter administration that enabled it. And now we have a similar situation, a follow up on that, that have been enabled the Iranian uh, regime to continue to be strong. I want to pick up on this, but I want to take another quick break. So everyone stay tuned. The restoration of Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel was an earth shattering event. For Christians, it was a confirmation that God always keeps his covenantal promises. Today, we are blessed to see God's fingerprints in the modern miracle of the land of Israel playing out in our lives among the people and in the state of Israel. This year, on the occasion of Israel's 75th anniversary, the Genesis 123 Foundation has been privileged to bring together 75 Christian leaders from around the world to lend their unique voices, sharing their personal faith experiences relating to Israel and their in-depth insight into Israel's history and spiritual significance, creating an historical, one-of-a-kind, high-end coffee table book, Israel the Miracle. Israel the Miracle's stunning imagery will fill your home with the hope of fulfilled promises and conversations about Israel. It's a perfect gift to anyone for any occasion, and most of all, to yourself. You'll also be a blessing to Israel, knowing that the proceeds will go to blessed Israelis of all backgrounds. Be a part of Israel the Miracle and bring the land, the people, and the state of Israel into your heart and into your home. Visit IsraelTheMiracle.com to get your limited edition copy today. Okay, fascinating and, and really quite engaging conversation with Dr. Roland Roberts, U.S. presidential candidate. Um, I'm, I'm very, in, I'm enjoying the conversation very much. Now I'd like to, unless there's anything that you want to add and a good politician will weave in what he wants to say, regardless of the question. So, but I'm inviting you to do that. Um, I want to talk about the candidates, the people that you're running against, both within the Republican Party, in which you're a candidate, and your positions on Israel, your your position versus the others. And you address that a little bit. And then and then we'll come to talk about the uh, the Biden administration. But but let's say you're on stage right now and 
all of the Republican candidates who the main ones, I suppose that there are probably others, um, but Trump and Nikki Haley and yourself are, are, are there. And the question comes up about Israel in the Middle East. How are you? Tr- Donald Trump does, to his credit, have a very decent record on, on issues relating to the Middle East, although many people say they were unclear about his policies. And Nikki Haley, as as uh, ambassador to the United Nations and before that, governor of South, Car- South Carolina, also very strong about Israel. How is Dr. Roland Roberts distinguishing himself on that stage from the other two? Sure. Well, I will tell you, Jonathan, that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Who the people are matters. And, and, and I hope the world wakes up and the United States wakes up and realizes that who you are matters. Uh, character matters. See, the problem with every name that you've mentioned, uh, they will go with whatever the political winds blow them. They will go wherever the money is. Uh, and that is the real difference. Leadership matters. And the reason America has had a character problem is because, uh, and we elect people with character problems, is because America has a character problem. We have to do right again. That's one of the reasons why I started the Righteous Nation movement was because righteousness exalts a nation um, and, 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 and sin is, destroys a nation. And so we want to be blessed. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We want to acknowledge God in America again. So that right there is one of the major differences. Uh, with with Donald Trump, for example, uh, you know, I'm great uh, grateful that we have an embassy in Jerusalem and that we went and did that. That's fantastic. Uh, but that wasn't because he believed spiritually that Israel is God is God's chosen people and the Jewish nation is God's chosen people. It it was a political move, not uh, a deep seated faith. Uh, the one means that the political winds wish will shift, and so will the policy. Uh, with Nikki Haley, it's more about expediency and money. Uh, as ambassador, the thing she did was because that was uh, politically correct to do it. Whenever the question I have for you and for all uh, American Jews that would even be voting or supporting any kind of a candidate for president, wh- who do you want in the White House when 97% of Americans are against Israel, against us supporting Israel, against us giving Israel $1? Wow, that's support? a very powerful argument. Which president do you want in the White House? Uh, At that point, why they support Israel matters. Who they are matters. Uh, And so all of a sudden, all of these other things, there's not even a question. There's not even a question. And that's actually, John, the way I believe with my my presidency as well. Uh, That's how I believe God will put us in the White House, uh, is not because we go through the normal path, but because just like Joseph, in the time of crisis and need in this country and around the world, I will be placed there. I will be set there for such a time as this, because things will get so bad. I've said if if there needs to be a Roberts presidency, things have to get a lot worse because they'll keep taking people. Americans will keep taking people that just sound good, that uh, play the normal games, go through the normal channels. They'll keep electing the next reality TV star and whoever's the most popular, you know, for class president. Uh as president of the United States. But when things get bad, they want someone who is real. They want someone who is genuine. They want someone whose faith is real, that it's not just about who I am, but it, it, and I don't run on, I'm a Christian. I run on America needs God. It's not about Roland Roberts. It's about, we need him at this time. Uh, and we need his help and his blessing and we need his mercy, uh, quite frankly. I love what you said. Who do you, who, who, whose values do you trust? Who, who, because, you're right. If if 97% of America flips against Israel, um, and someone's reading the polls because they want to get, which which is a great segue to where we're going to go in a moment about Biden. But uh, but if, if if politicians are reading the polls with Donald Trump, we don't have to worry about that so much because if he does win, that's his last term. He 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 can't uh, run again. So he's less beho- beho- beholden to the polls, but. Um, Oh, but that's a very correct statement. But he likes to be liked. That the, the difference with Donald Trump is he wants to be liked. Okay, that's a, that's a problem when you're trying to when you need a man of principle. Uh, and and I'm not casting anything on him. I'm just saying in general, you want to have people of principle. If 97 percent of Americans were against Israel, yeah, uh, he would not make a decision for Israel. 
he would exactly what he has said even in the past several days yeah. as it relates to Israel. He said it just needs to play out. That was his response to the Israeli war right now is it just needs to play out. Uh, well, sometimes things don't need to play out. They actually you actually need our support. You need our Correct. team. You need Correct. us to be with you. Uh, and so that is a uh, so, again, 97 percent of America against Israel. You do you what, what, what would you expect from a Nikki Haley? What would you expect from a Donald Trump? And what do you expect from a Joe Biden? I like so. Let's talk about President Biden for a minute. He, he, very recently, uh, two weeks ago, it's very interesting. This is not designed how these podcast episodes are coming. But two weeks ago, the topic was how the war against Hamas is going to be impacted by the U.S. presidential election, and and every ultimately, bottom line, everyone's talking about Michigan, right? Because if if the threat among Arab Americans to either vote against Biden or stay home and not vote, and I don't remember what the margin was that um, Biden won Michigan by in, in 2020, uh, but it was relatively small. Michigan, with its 15 electoral votes, can flip easily, and therefore, and and so can the presidential election. Um, but but what we've seen since the that conversation was recorded. I think three weeks ago, is something, frankly, shocking, um, which started out with Secretary Blinken saying, you used the phrase uh, from a different perspective, but talking about the dehumanization that Israel is guilty of against Palestinian Arabs in Gaza, which I wrote about and is not not just offensive. I mean, you can say offensive things that are correct, but it was wrong. And And if you're basing comments and policies on things that are not factual, that's deeply distressing. And then President Biden more recently was talking about how he how he doesn't support. He thinks that Israel's actions in Gaza have been over the top, which seemed like a very sudden flip. Uh, right. He did. It was a very quick flip flop. Um, now, he's he's also known to say things that are somewhat intemperate. I don't know. I don't know if I saw that if he was reading from a script or if he was just speaking extemporaneously. But that's troublesome, and it's troublesome coming right after uh, a, a different but related comment by Secretary Blinken. And then kind of the, the, the what's it called? The, um, I'm thinking the sports term, the, um, oh dear, I forget. It's what happens when you leave America and you don't focus on sports, and I'm here almost 20 years. The, the wild card, the wild card, Hillary Clinton, even chimes in, and this is great. You're actually going to like this. She said that the Netanyahu government has to go because they're responsible for the October 7th massacre by not being prepared. And I thought to myself, my goodness, did the woman not ever hear of Benghazi? Did the woman <laughs> not serve a president who funded the Iranians with billions of dollars, which if that didn't happen, perhaps we wouldn't be seeing the Iranian tentacles taking that, that we're dealing with now so i find that to be quite funny not in a laughing way and and troublesome um going on what happens if 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 you're only focusing on elections what's the first thing that you're going to do to undo we, we only know what troubles that the biden administration is making now there's nine months before the election and as we saw with with obama in the last two months of his um, presidency, when he was a lame duck, he did some very troublesome things vis-a-vis -vis Israel in the Middle East. What are you going to do to fix it? Well, they're disingenuous and it's disastrous. I can tell you that. And I will also say that the Israel in the Middle East scenario that I will have to address nine months from now, a year from now, is uh, going to be vastly different than things are today. Vastly different. It's not going to continue going the way it's going. Uh, I think it's going to be much, a much stronger uh, situation. And, and, and the, what's troublesome to me is the direction is the warmongers in the uh, in the powers that be around the world, uh, desperate for a World War Three, will will use Iran and Israel. Uh, as a as a pawn and as casualties of a their own prox their own bigger war and to line the pockets um, and to restructure the world order. Uh, this is where people who 
fundamentally do not have an understanding of of prophecy and how things will ultimately unfold. I don't care how great of a military strategist you are, and if you've been to West Point, if you lived there your whole life, you if you don't understand this, you don't understand the end game, regardless of what it looks like. It, it, you're walking and making policy and uh, military decisions by sight, not by knowledge of the holy or a wisdom. And the whole point of you know divine wisdom compared to man's wisdom, man's wisdom only goes by what you can see and then what is logical and what is calculating and what is strategic. Divine wisdom has steps and plans that are unseen that everyone always in retrospect says, well, how could you have known that? You couldn't have known. And the truth is you can, uh, but it's a divine wisdom. So uh, that is the difference, uh, one of the greatest differences from day one. But ultimately, when I say a different war, uh, it's the landscape is going to be so completely different. I believe that, um, you know, within 24 hours of October 7th, nations immediately said whether they were for Israel or against Israel. And that is not normal. Uh, it is not normal for Iran to come out and immediately support uh, the, the attack uh, and, and the Palestinians that attack. It was, it was also not normal for uh, Russia in the middle of their own conflict to immediately state within 24 hours that if Iran made a move in support of Palestine, they were standing with, with Iran. Uh, and then China said, well, we're standing with Russia and Iran. Uh, and, you know, some of that's not surprising. Uh, we know that when the armies of the world rise up against Israel for a final battle uh, of human history, that it's going to be Turkey, which the Turkish president spoke out, again, evil, uh, within 24 hours against Israel yeah. after they were attacked. Yeah. Uh, and so you have Turkey, you have Sudan, uh, you have Russia, Iran, uh, and, and Syria that are very much, and then, of course, with the support of China and North Korea, that very much support. Uh, so who does that lead? What would a war with those powers against Israel that forces, I mean, the U.S. Had, would take all of our military prowess to support Israel? And how would you do that whenever the vast majority are against supporting Israel? See, but I do believe that something will change and shift in the United States to where we will be able to relate, and especially under my presidency. Uh, and here's how I know that that for, for every American Jew, they can trust this. I go back to after 9-11, and, you know, my first daughter was born in between the two crashes on 9-11-2001. Wow. Between the two crashes. And I don't think it's an accident that then my son was born on July 4th, on America's Independence Day, while I'm running for president of the United States. Has never happened with a presidential candidate. Uh, And it's been 60 years since there's even been a a baby in the White House, uh, which actually bodes well for families. Uh, And and, and that is part, by the way, of our national security is a strong family. That's yes. not an accident. It is intentional. We have to strengthen America's families. And you don't even have the problems. The issues, I must bring this out. Part of the issue with support for Israel or Palestinians in America has nothing to do with Palestinians or Israelis. Most people couldn't even point to it. Americans could not even point to it on a map. They never thought about it before, but they instantly took up Palestine's side. Why? It's because there's a, a number one, a, uh, the, the family has been significantly weakened in America. So they, that, that, that value of family, they do not even comprehend. Friends, Israel's at war, and the war may get worse before it gets better. Much worse. It's going to be a long war because the enemy is the epitome of evil. It's not just a matter of overcoming troops on a battlefield, but overcoming a theology, an ideology, an evil one. While the Genesis 123 Foundation has been overwhelmed with the support of so many donations to the Israel emergency campaign, there's so much more that needs to be done. We've invested your donations that we've received so far strategically to make the biggest impact possible, whether helping with soldiers and their equipment and personal needs, to providing civilian security for outlying border communities, 
to relocating and settling several families from near the Gaza war zone, launching the global petition drive to support Israel in the face of pressure for a ceasefire and long-term needs for at-risk children, traumatized now more than ever before. Please take a moment to pause this conversation right now and go to love.genesis123.co and donate generously. We value your trust and we will keep all donors informed about how and where your donations are being used to contribute to make the biggest impact possible. And when you use that link, love.genesis123.co, you can also send your prayers and words of encouragement to Israelis of all backgrounds, just sending your love, something that we need so desperately. Thank you, and God bless you and your loved ones. But the second thing is the other narrative that has that that breakdown of the home has targeted was this oppressed versus the oppressor. That narrative is what they use. And people from broken homes are the ones easiest to gravitate to this. Okay. okay. So that that philosophy of the oppress and the oppressor is who naturally just craved with every emotional, it's so emotional for them. And it is because of how personal it was in the pain that they experienced personally. The problem, and this is the deception of the enemy, and I mean enemy as in Satan at this point, the, it, it, the purveyor of evil and wickedness on earth. He is the one responsible for preying on this oppressed versus the oppressor. And he has manipulated in their minds who is the oppressed and who is the oppressor. He has turned their emotions, their pain, and is using it against them yeah. because of the breakdown of the family in America. Well, I, you, we could go on for another couple of hours with this conversation. I'm really enjoying it. I'm appreciating the depth, um, the clarity. I want to just comment on one thing you said and then maybe set up the last question. Um, you, you, you spoke about in terms of American Jews and Israel. But I, I but I think and the important thing, and certainly the important thing for you as a Christian who is relatable to other Christians is, in fact, American Christians um, who who are going to be who are watching this or listening to this. And they're saying, amen. Right. That this is that you're, you're abundantly relatable to to uh, to to that segment. And that's a quite a large segment. So I don't want you to forget that because American Jews, even if. And I speak as one, I'm a dual citizen, but sadly, American Jews um, for far too long have just voted party line Democrat for a variety of reasons. That's another conversation. And, and they're not going to look at you. Um, and anyway, the, 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 the number of American Jews and the states in which we're concentrated and we vote, you're gonna, it's going to be harder for you to win New York and New Jersey and, and California. Uh, anyway, having said that, what I'm admiring so much is the biblical compass that's guiding you and will guide Robert's presidency. Um, I, I paid attention, watched a bunch of your videos, read whatever I could. Um, I one I particularly appreciated at one point, I don't remember where it was, but you refer to Palestine, not a term that I use because it doesn't exist, right. but you then said it, but then you said, but it's not even a recognized state. And and so my question is, it was, again, it was a conversation I was just having today with the with the head of a major ministry based here in Jerusalem. The state of Palestine never existed. It doesn't exist. And I was born in 1964. That's the same year that the Palestinian Liberation Organization was born. And that's the same decade in which the 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 ethnicity of being a Palestinian, as in an Arab, was invented. And I don't say that in a pejorative way. It's just the reality, because I know that in 1937, when my father was born here, he was referred to as a Palestinian, because until 1948, when all Palestinians became Israelis, then then it was only a decade or so later that the whole notion of having a separate, distinct Arab ethnicity of Palestinians came into existence. Having said that, we're in 2024. There are five, maybe more millions people here and others around the world who identify themselves as a Palestinian. They exist. There's a there's a conflict between 
Arabs who live on the other side of the wall here. Um, not quite a stone's throw, but not much further. And and us for our existence. What do you have a beginning of a solution? I'm not even asking for the solution. A beginning of a solution that you're gonna strive toward that's not going to be the standard pull up, pull out of the sleeve, two state solution. What's your right, what, what's President that, Roberts solution? That, that that is frustrating when it's always just a two state solution. We by the way, we did that. The United States did that with Sudan. Uh, uh it, true. whenever they their, their conflict in two thousand uh, well, it, which generationally, but in two thousand six, the Bush administration, Condoleezza Rice, Secretary Rice, uh they they started a two state solution for Sudan because it was Christians versus Muslims. Uh and now we have Sudan and we have South Sudan. So they did that. It became official in two thousand eleven. And guess what happened ever since 2011? They just started fighting each other. It yeah. didn't stop the fighting. Uh, what I can tell you, my objective uh, is for peace uh, in Jerusalem and the peace of Jerusalem. But there are things that have that that that's, that uh, will there will be more conflict because uh, the temple, uh, you know, is uh, is not where it ought to be in terms of uh, the final temple. Uh, it must, it, it will be rebuilt according to scripture one day. And, uh, that's not going to happen without a fight. You and I both know that. What I can tell you though is my administration, uh, will be, will be promoting, not giving, um, a two state solution or giving land. This goes back to Isaac and Ishmael. And it's that conflict is not going to stop. What needs to stop is the, the, I'm going to annihilate the Jews and destroy the Jews and I'm going to, kill all the Jews, and the, the indoctrination uh, is evil and wicked, and we're funding a lot of it, and that is what I will cut off. One of the many things I will do day one is cut off all support, uh, and that's not a, 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 a creating a humanitarian crisis. That is negotiating. Do you want food and water? And by the way, that's not where all of our money and aid is going. It's going for the people at the top of Hezbollah, and the top of the, the, those who have ruled Gaza, to absolutely live like kings of the biblical proportions, not even. <laughs> uh, so it's not going to the people, uh, the citizens. Um, and, and if it was about food and water, we always want to make that available for people. And that's not what is happening, but we would be negotiating. Uh, you will not teach the destruction, uh, the genocide of an entire nation and people group, especially of all people of earth, God's chosen people and think we're going to support that message in any way, on any level. Well, that's very refreshing, especially in a week that, or a week, week and a half, that uh, UN, UNRWA, the United Nations Relief Works Agency, was found to have a number of employees that were involved in the October 7th massacre, part of Hamas, and most recently discovering a huge Hamas bunker under the major UNRWA um, uh, headquarters in Gaza. So that's very refreshing. Um, Dr. Roberts, last word. Um, what what have we not discussed relating to Israel and the Middle East that you want to put out there? Or why should Americans listening to this, if they haven't already heard the answer, uh, on, perhaps on broader issues, um, vote for you? Well, I can tell you that what is happening both in America, what is happening in American homes, and what is happening in Israel all bubbles up to the same issue, and that is we are in a spiritual war. And every there are other candidates uh, and former presidents who have who who can who know about the military who could fight a military war with no problem, but we don't have a single candidate for president of the United States who know how to fight and win a spiritual war, and that's the war we're in. That is the great war we're in. You wonder why we have so many teen pregnancies. You wonder why we have a fentanyl overdoses, number one killer of Americans today. You wonder why your children don't want to have anything to do with you and your children are wayward, and your homes, husband and wives are fighting, and spouses, uh, are, are the marriages are dissolving, and the home is completely being destroyed. I'm telling you, it all is a spiritual war. And if we want God's blessing on America again, if we want God's blessing in this world, everyone around the world knows, knows it's upside down. Right is being called wrong. Wrong is being called right. Evil is celebrated, and uh, and, and right is demonized. And uh, but with Roland Roberts as president, we will have God's blessing on America and 
on the world again, because we will do right by all people and nations on earth. Very nice. Thank you. Where can people get more information and be involved with your campaign? RolandRoberts.com, R-O-L-L-A-N, Roberts.com, or RighteousNation.org. Ah, lovely. Okay. Um, Dr. Roland Roberts, I knew this was going to be an interesting conversation. I knew it was my privilege. I didn't realize how much both. And I'm real grateful for you making the time. I wish you lots of success um, in, in, in this uh, campaign. It's not easy. It's not going to be easy. And and I'm privileged to be part of showing showing who you are and giving Americans another choice, uh, a choice that's outside the box. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to having further conversations and love to come visit you in the building behind you one day soon. Amen. Likewise. Thank you so much. Thank Bless you. you. So I always say people who've been following inspiration from Zion for what were three and a half years, the last two and a half years, we want to give you incentive to continue liking and following and sharing this this program. And this is a great episode. Uh, if you haven't done that, to begin sharing um, where we created a project called From Jonathan's Bookshelf. And every month we pick a new person at random who's liked, followed or shared inspiration from Zion on the social media to receive a meaningful book. And selfish, selflessly, selfishly, excuse me, for the last several months, we've been promoting Israel the Miracle, which is an extraordinary book. And I don't say that just because I was the one behind putting it together. It's something that will bless you and your families. And I want you to have. You can go to IsraelTheMiracle.com and buy your own book. But if you like, follow, and or share inspiration from Zion, this episode, this month, we're going to pick one person at random and you're going to become the owner at my as my gift. Uh, for you to have a copy of that. We're always grateful that this podcast is sponsored by our friends at the Willow Run Greenhouse in Culpeper, Virginia. If you're ever in the area, hop in and thank them for helping make conversations like this possible. And also special thanks to the Coin family as well for their meaningful sponsorship. Gen- the Genesis 123 Foundation and Inspiration from Zion are always made possible by donations. So please consider joining us to help continue the dialogue and continue to build bridges between Jews and Christians. If you'd like to sponsor a future episode in honor, memory of a loved one or special occasion, or your favorite presidential candidate, please be in touch at inspirationfromzion at gmail.com. We'd always love to hear your comments as part of a dialogue and invite you to send any questions as well, especially questions about traditional Judaism for our Ask the Rabbi programs. Please share this with others who will also find it of interest, and please continue to join us right here where we continue to bring you more meaningful conversations about Israel that you won't hear anywhere else, wherever you are in the world. I pray that you and all your loved ones are safe and healthy and send my blessings from right here in the Judean mountains. God bless you.